All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the IOCBF's uh, town hall on BFRBs and how to manage BFRBs in this crazy time of COVID-19. Um, I'm Jennifer Rakes. I um, am the executive director of, of, of a sort of sister organization to the IOCDF, the ELC Foundation for Body-Focused Repetitive Behaviors. So we um, are very uh, familiar with BFRBs, both as, a, as an organization and I personally have a um, hair pulling disorder as well as um, some skin picking disorder and have been living with that my life. Um, and it runs in my family as well. So my mom, my sister, my children, me, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a big part of our lives. Um, so I'm really happy to be able to be here with all of you and to um, be able to field your questions for the wonderful experts that we have here with us today on this topic. Um, right now we have with us Nancy Cuthin, uh, who uh, is um, a psychologist at Massachusetts General Hospital and uh, has been uh, serves on both the IOCDF and the TLC's uh, scientific advisory board, um, has written countless uh, research articles as well as several books on this topic. And, um, and then we also have with us right now Fred Penzel, who uh, also serves on these both boards and um, is in private practice in uh, Suffolk, uh, Long Island. Uh, and um, both Nancy and Fred have been two of the the very small cadre of experts uh, pioneering treatment and research in this in this field of BFRB. So you could not be in better hands in terms of of trying to get your questions answered. And then hopefully joining us very soon will be Charles Mansueto, Dr. Charles Mansueto, who um, runs the Behavior Center, uh, Behavior Therapy Center of Greater Washington in Silver Spring, Maryland, and is also uh, one of the pioneers in this field in terms of developing uh, our current best practice treatments. Uh, so uh, this uh, format for this, um, uh, for this event is that you, uh, unfortunately, we don't get to see you. We would love to, but um, but that wouldn't be feasible. So you get to type in your questions and I will field your questions to Nancy, Fred, and, um, and hopefully very soon, Charlie as well. Um, and, uh, and I'll do my best to interpret uh, your questions if there's any confusion or I might ask you to type in some follow-up. Um, but feel free to start typing in your questions and I'll just get the conversation going with a few of my own. Um, but first, maybe Nancy and then Fred, maybe you want to just say a few introductory uh, words. Sure. So as we all know, this is uh, uncharted territory, what we're dealing with for the first time. And I think it has specific implications for individuals with BFRBs. We all know that we're not supposed to be touching our eyes, our noses, and our mouths. And uh, individuals with BFRBs very often uh, are feeling their skin to find areas that aren't smooth or they're palpating, uh, they're touching as well, eyebrows and eyelashes. Um, oftentimes there's oral involvement as well, which is concerning. And very often people are doing these things out of awareness. So this is uh, very timely that we're having this webinar to try and help people to figure out how to change some of the behaviors that could be of particular concern in light of the coronavirus. Thanks, it's my turn. <coughs> uh, obviously these are very unusual times that we're experiencing right now. And I've always said that one of the worst things for people with BFRBs is uh, too much time on your hands or stress, of which we all have uh, a lot of both right now. And I think this has you know, made it difficult for uh, people to manage themselves in general. I, I've always believed that this is a form of self-regulation. It's a way of dealing with either uh, being overstimulated or understimulated. And of course, in the current situation, we have a mix of both, of, of being uh, overstimulated by the flood of uh, all kinds of scary news and precautions that we have to take. and uh, you know, all the, the various new 
issues and worries that we have to cope with on a day-to-day basis that we never really had to think about before. And on the other hand, there's also the understimulation of being stuck at home and not being able to carry out our usual activities or take part in the things we, we normally do. So uh, everybody's sort of being caught in a, what I would call a two-way stretch here. So it, it's going to, I think, call on everybody to uh, use all the tools and techniques that they possibly have and to really be more mindful, I would say, of uh, where they're at at any given moment, uh, even more so than they normally are, because as I say, these are uh, extreme and unusual times. You know, and I think that we have less contact with people, so there's less social inhibition. I think for people that are at home by themselves and have privacy, obviously it's easy to rationalize getting away with doing a little bit more picking and pulling, thinking that you won't see people. Some people have less access to their therapists if their therapists aren't doing telehealth. So there's less accountability. And as Dr. Benzel was mentioning, there's less structure to our days. So um, there's, there's more boredom. Um, and very often we don't have the normal, you know, reinforcers that we have of accomplishing a job or having social interaction. Um, but I, you know, I think there's good news and bad news. I think what I just said was the bad news, but I think the good news is because Uh, we sometimes do have more privacy, that we can use more of the barriers that oftentimes my patients will say, you know, I can't have Band-Aids on my fingers in the office, or I can't wear gloves or hats, um, or use other techniques that could be cueing techniques. But if we have more privacy, I think people are better able to do that. And I think people can use their time in a more constructive way to do real-time monitoring of their symptoms, of their urges, to more religiously practice computer, competing motor responses, which we all know can be so helpful. So we just have to take the downsides and we have to you know, flip them and find a way that we can um, help ourselves in this time, given what we do have. Yeah, if I can add some, I think there's also another issue, which is kind of an umbrella Issue and I actually put this out online at the, when this, all this uh, home uh, sequestration began, which is that uh, it's very, very important. I think and I tell this to all my patients: <clears throat> it's very important to have structure and not just leave your days wide open. That every day should have, <clears throat> excuse me, a, a purpose and it should have a form to it. You should have some kind of a form to your day, and that, that would include, you know, not only having regular, you know, wake up and bedtimes, uh, getting some exercise in, eating properly. I think it's all, and I've been telling my patients, it's really, a lot of it is also about balance, basically. So it's not so easy to maintain balance under these circumstances, but, you know, because you don't have your usual external uh, events and and, uh, requirements. So I think what you need to do now is you have to provide your own structure and and, and achieve your own balance on a day-to-day basis, because I think health comes from living in a state of balance. So I think the more you, you balance yourself overall and you put that together with uh, the kind of things that, that uh, Dr. Cuthin was just talking about, <clears throat> I think you have a, a much better chance of, of getting through this in the best possible shape. Right, well, we have amazing people asking questions here on, on our chat group. Um, and, and I'm excited to tell you that we have people with us right now from India, from Scotland, from uh, you know all over the US, um, from Nigeria. I mean, this is this is clearly a problem that spans the world and does not discriminate. And it's really um, for me the silver lining of of this whole quarantine experience is to have this feeling of a of a shared experience with people all over the world. Even if this is a negative shared experience, it's still it's nice to know that we are truly not alone. Um, so let me and, and Germany and Wales, I'm getting wow. in England. I'm, that's, it's amazing. This is like such a such a gift in a way to be able to communicate all around the world. Um, so let me throw a, a few of the questions that come out. I mean, what I'm seeing is people are just struggling and many people obviously haven't even had access to sort of basic information about how do we stop doing these problems, uh, how these behaviors. So um, let me, uh, I'll just sort of start in the order that I've got the questions. Oh, and Charlie's with us. Welcome. Okay, I had my Charlie. Wi-Fi's been out and it just clicked. Oh, man. So I apologize for uh, get it not being with you from the beginning. But no, I'm now. So use me, whatever way uh, you'd like. 
<laughs> we um, we are just getting started with people are typing in their questions. And so I'm just starting to field questions. So I'm going to ask the question on their behalf. And, and we've got people here from all over the world. And then um, Nancy and Fred and Charlie just go ahead and answer, you know, take turns or uh, as you see fit. Uh, and we do have a lot of questions, so we'll try to, um, you know, keep our answers succinct, succinct enough so that we can get to a lot of questions in the next hour. Okay. Nice to see you all, by the way. It's great to see you. You too. Um, so the very so the first question I see is Antonella Bortoli uh, at, at uh, ten a.m. ten o five a.m. Uh, says I'm suffering from dermatillomania. How do I stop picking when I want to pick? I'm aware when I decide to pick, and that's the problem. So I, I can start off with it. I think, you know, you want to do a functional analysis of the behavior. So when you have urges to skin pick, I would suggest you try to identify things like, how are you feeling? What are you thinking? Um, what situation are you in? What time of day? To try and understand what may be the drivers behind the picking. Are you picking to um, alleviate some uncomfortable emotions? Um, are you picking because of a physical sensation? Um, some people pick because they like to extract the tissue and to manipulate it or to chew on it. So I think we need to understand a little bit more data as to what purpose the picking serves for you. And then I think some of the coping strategies would stream from that. Can, can I, uh, since I just got here, I think <laughs> I'll uh, assert myself. But, uh, yeah, I, I just uh, would say that uh, Nancy's perfectly on target there. Uh, and that's something though that might take a little while to get going. Often, often these habits are so ingrained uh, with uh, the fabric of life that uh, that people aren't quite clear on, on what is generating the urge at the, or the, uh, the behavior pattern at that moment. So uh, probably early on, at least a way to get going, and, and again, building on what Nancy said, was to uh, prepare in advance to do other things at the moment when it's most likely that, that the, uh, uh, the picking in, uh, occurs. Uh, there's so much more to learn bef uh, uh, about, uh, be even to advise this, uh, Antonella, about this. Uh, it's, it's out on a limb, but I think in a general sense, the functional analysis, meaning just what is this doing for me? How is it serving me in, in ways that, that I might become aware of if I study myself a little better and, and watch this over time? And in the meantime, begin to expect that the next time it occurs, and often it's in similar places with similar times, that there is some preparation to do other things, to be busy in other ways. And that's... Uh, uh, at least a start on on uh, answering the question that Antonella brought us. I think in line with what Charles, I think you have to kind of be on the lookout for patterns, basically as as a place to start. You know, do you where do you do you find these things regularly happening under the same set of circumstances in the same places or at the same time? And and in line with something I I mentioned earlier, uh, I think you can also ask yourself if. At that moment, you are either understimulated or overstimulated. Are you stressed in some way? Are you feeling pushed about something? Or are you just bored and having nothing to do? And, and that's also another place you can start as well. I think, uh, you know, obviously it's going to take time. Uh, you know, if, if you could obviously just stop, you wouldn't have a BFRB, uh, which, you know, I'm sure everybody with a BFRB is uh, tired of people saying to them, well, why don't you just not do it, you know? But of course, you can't just choose to not do. So you're gonna you're gonna have to develop and and uh, a way of retraining yourself, either with the help of a therapist or not, then on, on your own. But it's it's gonna take you know work over time. Don't don't get easily discouraged and don't look for instant uh, perfect results with this. It's it's a retraining process and and it's something you're gonna have to work on regularly. Great. So I have another question for you guys. I know none of you are psychiatrists, but this question I'm sure you hear a lot. Kathleen at 10.05 a.m. is asking, are there certain medications that seem to help with these behaviors? 
So there haven't been a lot of medication studies. Um, what we look for are randomized controlled trials to say that a medication is effective. You wanna compare what you think is an active agent with a placebo. Those are very expensive studies. There haven't been a lot. Um, historically, we thought the medications that treat OCD would be helpful because picking and pulling are very similar in that they seem like a compulsive repetitive behavior, but we know now that they're different. And those medications that historically were used to treat OCD, they're called selective serotonergic reuptake inhibitors. Um, generally, we feel that they're no better now than a placebo. Um, there are a couple of medications that have been shown to have some benefit. Um, one thing that I would say is if there is a comorbid condition, so if you have anxiety or depression accompanying the picking or the pulling, very often it's important for you to try to address those conditions because if you address those, then maybe you'll find that it's easier to control the picking and the pulling. Um, there are some, there's some limited efficacy for some medications. I think the one that most people are the most excited about is something that's called N-acetylcysteine. Um, it's something that you've probably heard about. Um, it's used in emergency rooms when people have acetaminophen overdoses, um, but we feel that it's, it could be helpful for BFRBs because this substance works on the part of the brain that's involved in reward processing. Um, however, we don't have a lot of studies on N-acetylcysteine, also known as NAC. And I think most people would say that a medication can be helpful, but that alone is not gonna be sufficient, that you're still gonna have to change behavior. A medication is not gonna change a habit. So, um, I, I would hazard to say most people would still say that CBT is the first line of intervention for treatment of these disorders. Well, that's a decent segue to just point out, especially if you are part of this town hall audience and, and haven't had a grounding in what, you know, sort of hadn't, haven't had the opportunity to, to learn deeply about current best practice treatments, I would... Um, point you to a publication that um, the TLC Foundation puts out called, and it's written by uh, members of our scientific advisory board like Nancy, Charlie, and Fred. Um, it's called the Expert Consensus Treatment Guidelines for Body-Focused Repetitive um, Behaviors. And so that's a really good starting place. And it's, it's a document that you can read yourself so that you understand the big picture of what are current, the most effective treatments currently. And also it's written in a way that um, if you want to share it with a medical professional, if you want to give it either to your GP or to your therapist, um, it's meant to be a tool for um, the medical profession as well or the therapeutic profession to be able to understand if they're not, if they themselves are not yet educated about best practice treatments. So I would definitely um, point you to that, to that document as a really good starting place because I, I, I know that we need to be educated ourselves about what current best practice treatments are, um, even when seeking help from professionals, because often not the professional treatment professionals don't actually know a lot about these disorders, um, unless you're finding an expert like Nancy, Charlie, or Fred. So. One point that, that maybe should be underlined here, and that is uh, just so there's no misconceptions. Uh, the disappointment is that there's no medication that targets these behaviors specifically. Uh, and that's a shame. And the search continues to in the hopes of finding that, me uh, that uh, medication or class of medications. But in the meantime, there are uh, uh, people who are have other conditions besides the BFRBs that might be depressed, be under a lot of stress, have anxiety, have ADD and so forth. And, and these are, uh, are um, other problems that ha do respond to medication when used appropriately and carefully and by a skilled uh, pharmacologist. So, uh, so just so people who are on medication and have these problems and have been disappointed that the uh, skin picking or hair pulling hasn't hasn't waned or disappeared, uh, it still may be serving functions in other ways. And there are people where these 
uh, coexisting condition are impacting on their, on their skin picking or pulling and helps them better. And as uh, again, Nancy had pointed out, better benefit from the uh, techniques that are employed in, in behavioral approaches, cognitive behavioral approaches. Yeah. yeah. I think everybody would like to have a quick fix. And that's where, you know, medication, the idea of medication can be very alluring and all. I, I think medication can help people to do therapy. And I think that's how it should best be regarded rather than a, a treatment that, that stands alone uh, by itself. The, uh, also, I, I would recommend that uh, people be careful about just running right out and die and uh, dosing themselves with NAC without uh, checking up on this uh, kind of, you know, there's things you need to know about it. And uh, I, unfortunately, your professional, your medical professional may not know a lot about this uh, either, but there is reliable information out there. I think is is the TLC website have uh, an article on this? Yeah, I don't know the exact URL to find the specific article, but um, if you go to bfrb.org, there is information, or just email us at info at bfrb.org if you can't find the NAC information that you're looking for. Um, we'll be happy to follow up with you. One one other, I think there's one other point about medication, which is sort of coming from the opposite direction, is that uh, there are some medications that you might want to look out for that can sometimes have the opposite effect that can actually cause people to pull or pick more, unfortunately. Uh, some of the stimulant medications that are given for ADD uh, can sometimes increase people's pulling and picking. Uh, some antidepressants, if they're overstimulating to some people, can also increase their uh, picking and pulling. Now, nobody's saying, you know, stop taking your medication right away if you think it's doing that, but if you think that it is having some kind of an adverse effect, you should talk it over with uh, the person prescribing for you and, and see if uh, that actually is the case or not. But it's, it's, uh, some people have noted that and it's, it's worth looking into sometimes. Yeah, I agree. Uh, having experienced that in my own family. Um, I, so uh, are we ready for another question? I mean, this actually is a, is a segue from what you were just talking about in terms of comorbid uh, coexisting mm -hmm. other problems. So Ivy at 10.06 a.m. Uh, writes that um, she's recently relapsed into hair pulling and it's worse than the last time uh, she pulls when she got a bad grade she pulls because she's worried about COVID-19 um, maybe she pulls when you know uh, many worries uh, seem to cause it and when and I when she, she it feels like all my problems will go away if I pull when I do I get a high and then afterwards I feel so depressed I've also been doing some skin picking when in a panic attack phase I'm always on the verge of tears what can I do well, I, you know, I think there are a number of parts to what was, you know, just posed to us as a question. Um, I think there are a broad array of skills that you could um, learn at this point. I would think it would be helpful for somebody to talk to you and get more detail to know, you know, how often are you having panic attacks? How depressed are you to see if that's at a clinical um, level of diagnosis, which may require uh, other treatment, as we were just saying. Um, but I think learning how to deal with the ambiguity of what's going on right now, um, maybe some mindfulness would be very helpful. There are cognitive behavioral skills that people can use to deal with panic attacks that could help you to feel better in control of your body. Um, you know, learning how to cope with disappointment, like a bad grade, um, that's one, uh, one event in your life. Um, it will come and it will go and you can learn from it and it's not going to grind your life to a halt. So I think you need a very um, kind of stepwise plan, but I would want to know, you know, what, what is the broad array of your problems? Try to figure out what is the most important right now. Um, so again, when you said you're depressed, I don't know how depressed you are. I would want to know that as a clinician. Um, and then for people to figure out how to take this apart and work on it step by step. So you start to feel some control. And I think it's all connected, right? I think if, if one is depressed, they're going to have less resilience to practice um, the cognitive behavioral skills. If one is very anxious, they're going to want to engage in BFRBs for soothing, right? So... Uh, you know, hopefully that gives you some ideas of where to start. And, you know, maybe we can hear from Dr. Mansueto and Dr. Penzel. Mm -hmm. 
uh, what go, ahead. Uh, go ahead, Fred. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I think as we were saying before, you know, there are many possible inputs into uh, BFRBs and certainly uh, uh, cognitive or, or thinking uh, inputs and emotional inputs are, are certainly right up there with uh, the rest of them. And I think having the skills to manage these things is going to be a big uh, help to you with this and, and to anybody really who finds that they pull when they're in particular emotional states or they're feeling certain levels of anxiety or find themselves faced with uh, things that uh, are dislikable that they, they can't directly control. And I think just learning how to uh, get along and live in a world that isn't set up to give us everything we want or to always make us feel reassured, I, I think you know this is where therapy really comes in handy and, and can teach you the things you need to do this. Now, will it stop all your pulling and picking? No, but it, it'll certainly uh, ease a lot of the, the pressure on you that seems to be leading to this. And you put that together with you know other management skills with this, and then I think you have a real uh, winning combination. But the, the things that you've described are certainly treatable and, and certainly uh, things that you can learn how to do. Uh, you can learn these at any point in your life. And, and also, if I could just mention, you, you use the word relapse. I, I always say that a, I would refer to it more as a lapse. I always like to say a lapse, or as many people say, a lapse is not a relapse. It doesn't mean a, a relapse is when you went back to square one and forgot everything you ever learned that helped you. And, and I think a, a lapse is just uh, sort of a temporary setback. I think, I think you have to uh, uh, treat it as, as such. I, I like to say there's potholes on the road to recovery and all. And, and sometimes we even have to endure uh, setbacks like that, but it, it's never final. You know, uh, I think it was uh, the writer F. Scott Fitzgerald who said that uh, never confuse a single defeat with a final defeat. So keep on working on these things, get the help you need and uh, get right back to where you were. Yeah, and I think Ivy's question brings up a, a, an important point, and that is that, is that uh, uh, BFRBs are not are a, a slice of, of a person's life. It's not the person's life, and uh, it's important to look comprehensively and see that uh, that it, it's uh, the context is extremely important. We can't always uh, deal with the stresses of life, the strains, the problems we have that are ongoing. We have to work as Nancy's was pointing out in a sense in a methodical way what what do i need to deal with first and it isn't always the bfrb right it may be some of the the context the life issues the re re recurring problems uh the uh, psychological difficulties that are not specific uh, specific to the bfrb but are related in many ways so the whole person is really uh, 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 what we have to think about rather than just the uh, the bfrb I would just add that in this time of quarantine, <laughs> we may be feeling really cut off from our re from help resources. It, it you know you can't walk into a therapist's office right now, um, but this situation is driving the the growth of telehealth. Uh, you know, it's, it's it's expanding uh, rapidly, and one of the things that we're doing at TLC. Um, so again, resources that you will be able to find through BFRB.org is to create a telehealth directory of BFRB treatment specialists. So it's not fully functional yet, but again, if you email us, we can help guide you to therapists that we know are knowledgeable about BFRBs and who we also know are willing to do telehealth. Um, I think that's increasingly a lot of therapists uh, in this time because we don't have a choice. And so that's that's forcing us to expand that option, um, which I personally think can be a really great thing because are not a huge number of experts in this field, treatment providers. And so a lot of people, even before we were locked in our houses, were, were not in close proximity to a good treatment provider. Um, so I think that in some ways, uh, your ability to access a treatment might actually be expanding right now. Um, and don't be afraid to reach out and take advantage of that. I've, I, I think that this is a great time to reach out and try therapy because you've got the time, perhaps. It might be easier to schedule a, an appointment. Um, so follow up on that option if it feels like something that, that you need. Um, Anyway, okay. Um, so going from the sort of big picture of like really looking holistically at your at your situation and which problems you might need to tackle first, uh, Rebecca at 10, 10 a.m. 
was asking sort of, I think I'm going to, it's a longer comment, <laughs> but basically getting at some of the specific tools. I know Nancy, Fred and Charlie, you all have a huge list of specific tools that can really help. Um, she, uh, Rebecca's mentioning that she's tried gloves, but that certain fabrics don't feel good or they make her hands sweaty. So she's wondering if we know great gloves or if we have other suggestions. So I think maybe it might be helpful um, to just talk about what are some of the specific tools that are really helpful to your patients. Sure. You know, the first thing though I would suggest is that we really, really try to understand what the behavior does for you. Um, we can give you a generic treatment plan, but my experience has been that pickers and pullers are so incredibly different, um, you know, in terms of the patterns of pulling, what their triggers are, what it does for them. Is it an emotional thing? Is it a physical thing? that until we know that for you, I feel like we're just throwing everything at you when we have less likelihood of being successful. So that's the first thing. I hope you can really hear that because I think that's so important for your success. Um, that being said, I will give you the you know very quick drive-by overview and then I'm sure Dr. Masueto and Penzel will fill in all the pieces. Um, so we always want to do logging. We want to, logging will help you with understanding your patterns, but also trying to increase the awareness. Trying to be aware is step number one. If you're not aware very early on, you can't intervene early on. So if your hand is already up and you've selected the hair to pull or if you found the scab to pick at, it's gonna be so much more difficult. So awareness enhancement, which can come from logging, it can come from using barriers, it can come from other people cueing us, it can come from an awareness enhancement device. We want to do habit reversal, which includes a competing motor response. So when you're aware of an urge to pick or pull, or you've started to touch, or you've started to actually manipulate tissue, you want to bring the hand down, do something that's incompatible with picking or pulling for 90 seconds. I like the fists. Some people talk about manipulating, you know, a, a stress ball or holding tight onto the edge of a chair or a table. We always have our fists. We don't have the other things. Um, stimulus control techniques can be helpful. You talked about gloves. Gloves are just one, you know, example of a stimulus control thing for the hands. It can be, um, it can be band aids. It could be scotch tape. It could be cutlets, which are finger band aids. It could be finger sheaths. I've had people just take a little scotch tape and run it from the bed of the nail over the tip and then the pad of the finger. If they feel like they don't want something that's that you know obvious to others, if they don't have band aids in the time of coronavirus, um, you can use other things as barriers, either on the face, like a topical on an acne spot, um, on the hair. You can use gel. You can pull it back. You can use a shower cap, a bathing cap. I mean, I can go on and on and on with barriers. Everybody needs to figure out what is going to work the best for them. And that's a little bit of a trial and error that, you know, we can't be mind readers. Um, in terms of fiddle toys, it depends what you're looking for. Some people like a certain texture. Some people want something that has a clicking sound. Some people want something that has a stress and a release right? But having something to do when you're sedentary that occupies the hands um, would be helpful. Um, doing things like a manicure, you know, or um, moisturizing your hands when you're, you're engaged in a sedentary activity, you're probably going to be more aware of it, less likely to put your hands to your face or your hair. Um, so those things of habit reversal with competing motor response, stimulus control with barriers and fiddles, Everybody would do that. I would suggest that secondary uh, techniques along the lines of emotion regulation and distress tolerance and acceptance, like from acceptance and commitment therapy, would also be very, very helpful. I know I've done a drive-by review of all of this. You know, this, this could be a lecture series of 10 lectures. Um, but there are a lot of really great books out there. Dr. Mansueto has a new book, Dr. Pizzell has a book, I have an old book. I think you can find some very good references that will help explain these techniques for you. So fill in where I left off, Dr. Mansueto, <laughs> Dr. Penzel. Well, uh, actually, let me go ahead, Fred. 
So actually, there uh, on the TLC uh, website, there's a very large uh, collection of suggestions of things that you can use to help yourself. Just as uh, you know, if you need some some ideas to get you started, basically, I help put this list together with some other people, and it's it's pretty comprehensive. There's there's a lot of different things on there. Uh, and you know, I would certainly take a look at it. I think you'll find it very helpful. My own patients find it uh, quite useful. And just to deal for, uh, just momentarily with the question of gloves, I will say that what most of my patients have liked using and is very helpful are uh, cotton dermatological gloves, which you can get mostly at any uh, good sized drugstore there for people who want to put uh, medication or moisturizer on their hands and not have it rub off. Basically, they breathe, they're uh, disposable. Uh, they're very soft, and they won't make your hands sweat. So if you're looking for that, I would say uh, the cotton dermatological gloves are good. But in general, it's it, there's no – I always say that everything works for somebody, but nothing works for everybody. It's it's trial and error, basically. You have to start from things that you think will work for you and then experiment, basically. Don't don't be afraid to try a lot of different things. I often tell people to, uh, uh, you know, when they can get out to these places to, like uh, – like stores like, uh, you know, Home Depot type stores or large chain drug stores, places which you can actually still go to at the present time with proper precautions, of course. And, uh, you know, just see what see what they have. See if something suggests itself to you or something you have around the house. Uh, but again, that's only that these things I deal like with the sensory part of the issues. I think as as uh, Nancy was saying, uh, you know, there's a lot of other things that are, are equally important that that need to be. Uh, dealt with the the uh, things that address the uh, emotional inputs into this, things that have to do with the, just beliefs that you have. You know, like oh, I'll, if I just uh, pull this hair, I'll, I'll all my troubles will go away and I'll feel better. These these things have to be uh, addressed also. Again, you have to look at the whole picture. You know, the whole background against which these things are taking uh, place. But uh, again, there's no there's like no one size fits all for this. We we always believe that therapy has to be tailored. To each individual and whether you're working with somebody or you're doing it on your own uh you're gonna have to find what works best for you essentially i think there are two uh competing ideas that interfere with uh, uh an individual's ability to make progress against their bfrb uh one is is that finding the right element will will be the right the answer the right gloves the right I used to complain in the early days of this that that uh, behavior therapy many people thought was kush ball therapy. You get a kush ball and that would solve your problems, and you know, and I, obviously it doesn't. Uh, any one thing <clears throat> will not usually address the fact that that BFRBs play multiple roles in a person's functioning. I'll come back to that in just a moment. Uh, but the other uh, extreme is, or uh, the other. Uh, bothersome perspective is that there's just so many different things is hearing about gloves and creams and anti uh, acne medications. Uh, it just seems overwhelming that a person doesn't know where to start. And that's why uh, it's, it's very useful to be methodical about it. And, um, and that's why uh, I and my colleagues have, have used an approach that, that systematically looks at the different, realms in which BFRBs function. For example, there are people who have unhelpful thoughts about uh, about their picking or pulling, that they must, for example, uh, squeeze something has to come out of every perfect patch of skin. And that leads people often to even squeeze that healthy skin. Uh, that's an idea that that goes unchallenged. And, uh, but if someone is at the mirror uh, trying to get something out and they wind up getting out blood, lymph fluid, they've done more damage than they've actually done. And yet they may have a feeling that it's accomplished. Well, that's that's within the, the thinking realm, the belief realm, the cognitive realm is the technical term for that. And uh, and it's useful to find, for a person to, to think about and explore whether or not they have any, any unhealthy beliefs, like that they won't be able to settle down and get focused unless they get that bothersome hair out of the uh, out of their eyebrows that feel sharp and unpleasant. Uh, these are, again, just all what I've mentioned already are just a few of the, the many uh, differences from one individual to another. No pattern is precisely the same. We don't treat the, uh, with, with uh, 
uh, cognitive behavioral techniques. We don't treat the the diagnosis. We treat the individual with the with the own their own characteristics, and that needs to be explored. But a person can can explore them to find out. Uh, again, what are the sensory kinds of things that they enjoy that pay off for them? Getting out a certain hair or having hairs to do something with or getting that little interesting ball on the end. What about skin picking to get that smooth feeling, to get rid of that rough, crusty uh, patch of skin. That can be very useful. But are there not other ways of dealing with that that don't require more damage? That's within the sensory realm. And you go on to the thinking realm. And then uh, one point that Nancy has, has underlined, very important, and uh, we know it, it's a factor, is the emotional side of it, that there can be emotional needs that are that an individual is using BFRBs or that functions, the BFRB functions, to in some way quiet them down when they're feeling unsettled, stimulate them when they're feeling lethargic, and so forth and so on. So to find alternative ways of dealing with those functions is important. And the uh, automatic nature of it, often the, the, uh, the hands having a mind of their own, reaching and feeling for the imperfections or hairs that are, are t uh, tempting targets, uh, these can happen on automatic pilot. Now, that can be brought uh, into better consciousness in varieties of ways, but for some, that's not important. They're their picking or pulling isn't done so automatically, although there may be minor automatic components, but some it's it's a great part of the whole whole picture. And finally, the, where the uh, problems occur, these are battlefields. Uh, most people don't pick or pull everywhere. They don't pick at the, often be, across the a dinner table at a fancy restaurant with, with a guest that they're trying to impress. Uh, they may, uh, the common places are in the bedroom and the in the bathroom, wherever there's solitude, in the study carol in the library. So to get the whole picture across a number of domains can be extremely important. But how does one do that? And that's where the systematic nature of therapy or of guides that, that help a person uh, self-create uh, a, uh, a set of factors uniquely geared to his or her particular pattern that winds up being probably the most uh, uh, desirable and least frustrating of the, of the approaches. So one, one uh, we all love to think that one thing, if I just get that one kind of right thing to feel, the right kind, or the, the right cream to put on something, we all hope that, that that one thing will do it, but it's rarely the case. It often leads to disappointment and people thinking, this is hopeless. I've tried the gloves, I've tried the koosh ball, I've tried the creams. Well, those were not the things that solved their problems. And it doesn't mean they're insolvable. It, it means that the pattern, the picture needs to be addressed in a more systematic and, and glove in hand fit for that individual. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and Charlie and, and Ruth and Fred, I think we should mention your books as resources. Uh, so maybe you each just want to tell us the name or where to find your current books. Cause Charlie, I know you have a book out just recently that is a self-help guide to how to do behavior therapy. So if you don't have, you know, immediate access to a, a therapist, um, that, that can be a very helpful resource. Um, I can't think of the name of it. <laughs> <laughs> it is on Amazon under my name, Mansueto, M-A-N-S-U-E-T-O. So uh, it's, uh, over, uh, you know, it's it just came out in January. It's, so, it's new enough. It came out. I in, should remember the title too because I wrote the foreword. Um, <laughs> the name somebody, the publisher insisted on this, and we didn't like that, and and so I have to name it in my head. But it's it's something. It's it's not War and Peace. Let me put it that way. <laughs> I'm, so I'm specifically mentioning it because it's a it's a self. It is meant to it be a self help, -help guide. guide. It leads people so, through the model we use, which is yeah. called the POM model, a comprehensive behavioral treatment model that we've used for now 30 years and, and many clinicians across the globe. And we, we teach that approach in the uh, in TLC's uh, professional training program. So it's something that's been used. It's widely used among clinicians. It is methodical. So it helps a person uh, move through the possibilities in a, in a way that uh, allows them to gear the particular choices of, of uh, elements to fit their patterns, yes. I'll I'll tell you the name some other time. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> and Fred has a very comprehensive book out if you're wanting sort of an overview of of, of the whole field. Um, and Fred, I'm also, I'm sorry, I should have like had all your books on hand when uh, when we started this, but uh, do you want to mention the name of your book? Yeah, it's called The Hair Pulling Problem. That's right, Fred Penzel. And then Nancy, yours is Help for Hair Pullers. That's right. Uh, yeah. Good. See, I remembered that one. Good. <laughs> so lots of resources out there um, and lots of questions coming in. And also, I'm sure you're all uh, I'm sure all of our audience is reading the live comments, but you guys are sending out wonderful ideas to each other as well and sharing ideas about what helps you. And that's wonderful. And that's the kind of thing that usually happens at our in-person events at our. And, and so it's wonderful to see that happening here as well in a, in a virtual event, just the ability for the community to share ideas about what helps you. Um, Kimmy at 10 14 AM asked what I think could be a, 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 a question that a lot of us have on our minds. She says, since these are not normal times, is there any level of acceptable picking, pulling for self-soothing as coping? Or would you still say it's better not to allow yourself to engage in your BFRB as much as you're able? That's a really great question. Um, because we are really not supposed to be touching our faces, I think trying to control it um, totally is the best thing because if you're picking at one side of your body, there's a good chance that it's going to lower the threshold for picking at another side. I don't think it's that easy to always just contain it. I, I really think the best is to, stri to strive for um, total abstinence from the behaviors. Now, that being said, that's a very lofty goal, right? Um, I think Marsha Linehan, who's you know the proponent of DBT, has this concept of dialectical abstinence that I really like. Um, her concept is that we want to try to cease the dysfunctional behavior, you know, totally, but that we will have setbacks, and that we we need to be forgiving ourselves when we have these setbacks, and to just get back on the horse and try again. Um, I think that's the best way to approach this rather than to try and do, you know, um, kind of like moderated drinking or controlled drinking. Um, I think it's better to try and control it as much as we can, particularly with the health risks right now. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And, and I, I think on a, on a thought level, I think the idea that needs to be challenged is that when I'm feeling certain ways or I'm in certain situations, I, I need to do this or I deserve to be able to do this. And, and I think that's the thing you need to challenge because you can find uh, other ways of, of channeling uh, these these uh, situations and also of uh, finding substitutes, finding uh, ways of either preventing yourself from doing it, do things to change your, uh, you know, to work on your emotional state at that time instead of just always saying, well, I, I, it's much easier for me to just turn to picking or pulling. And so I'll just do that at all as, as like a default kind of uh, position. So I think I think you have to watch out uh, for that, and and really you can't have it both ways. Like say, well, I really want to get rid of this problem, but I still should be able to do it now and then when I really really need it. And and the idea is to question the idea of whether you really do need it or whether you can find, uh, as I say, other substitutes or or ways to prevent it or ways to get at the underlying, uh, you know, emotion or sensory experience that's that's feeding into this. So so I, I would agree that you know abstinence obviously is the goal. Total abstinence, you know, again, is not something we shoot for immediately. Uh, in fact, I, I just wanted to bring up this term that you hear a lot, which is the term pull free and all, which I, I don't really like that term very much because it implies, you know, kind of like a perfect ability to control this. And I think it, it makes people feel like failures or sets them up. So, I mean, there may be times when, yeah, you know, you might slip up and, and uh, pull or pick or, or do whatever you do, but it it doesn't mean that you're a total failure either. You have to be aware of all or nothing thinking that, uh, you know, if you think that, oh, uh, so therefore I can never get better. So that's it. Uh, you know, I might as well just do whatever I do and give up. Uh, that That's, you know, a kind of perfectionism that you have to watch out for at all. Um, I, I will add Gwyneth at 10, 19. Uh, asked a question that I think is particularly relevant because we are 
because it is the IOCDF that is hosting this event. So many people are finding us through the OCD uh, Foundation. And we know there's a lot of comorbidity between OCD and BFRBs and also tick disorders. And so Gwyneth asks, is this related to the body ticks my child exhibits when feeling like I'm going to fall out of my body? She has scrupulosity and worries her soul will leave her body and she'll be possessed. So that's a very specific question that, that you can answer for, for Gwyneth, um, but also perhaps maybe a larger discussion of, of how, how do BFRBs and other disorders relate? Let's just start with OCD first. And uh, there was a time when the, uh, the really the, uh, the entire scientific community was a bit confused about this. In the, uh, let's say about 30 years ago, there were questions at National Institute of Mental Health, whether uh, uh, hair pulling in particular was a, a monosymptomatic, one symptom of OCD that, uh, and so it was called at times monosymptomatic OCD. Uh, it was very clear though with research and, and, uh, and other perspectives that have been clarified over the uh, 30 years since then that uh, OCD and, um, and BFRBs are quite different in their manifestation, probably in their underlying biology and, uh, and so forth. And they require different kinds of treatment because we know now that the drug for OCD uh, to, to a significant ex extent did not work. Uh, uh, BFRBs. So, uh, so it's it's now they're they're appropriately uh, distinguished. They have different, different factors, and yet, there are some interesting connections between the two. There, within families, for example, if you find uh, incidences of OCD, you're more likely than than by chance alone to find incidences of of BFRBs. And the other way too, if you find BFRBs, you're more likely to find OCD than by chance alone within families. And genetics are closing in and saying that there may be some common genes in, in these men. So while this is all being worked out, the most important practical thing I think for, for people to know is that it's not OCD. It's not OCD. If, the, uh, if their therapist or their uh, psychologist, their psychiatrist uh, says it is, they're probably not well informed and perhaps need to get other opinions about that. With regard to ticks, it's a little more... Uh, confusing. Uh, there is, uh, uh, we know less about the neurophysiology of, of ticks and and perhaps and, uh, and hair pulling, uh, and that it remains to be clarified. There are some, again, some yes. common features among the two, and uh, and about these are kind of problems that can interact in some way with BFRBs. Uh, there's many, m much more to say about that, but I'm going to leave it up to my two colleagues to to uh, find the places that they would like to address this issue uh, and, and flesh it out a bit. Mm -hmm. I think Charlie did a good job. I'm pleased with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, I, actually one thing I, I would just like to add, if I may, is that a, a lot of uh, people have felt there were links between uh, BFRBs and tick disorders because a lot of pulling can seem very, uh, and picking can seem very automatic and tick-like. It, it's not totally clear, you know, what that connection is or if they really are the same phenomenon, but uh, it, it does at times certainly look a lot like that, uh, although the treatment would, would uh, I think, be somewhat different for both of those problems. But there there is a certain amount of uh, gray area, I guess, between some of these disorders where they appear to sort of overlap or, or cross over. I can make one other comment. So there were two other pieces of evidence with BFRBs that made people think that they were linked to ticks. One was that uh, antipsychotics, neuroleptic drugs, which are often used successfully in the treatment of ticks, had some evidence of efficacy with BFRBs. Again, um, limited studies here. The second piece of evidence was neuroimaging. And in a study that was done many years ago at Mass General and has had replication, a part of the brain called the putamen, which is also involved in, in, in tick disorders, um, was shown to have um, an abnormality. So those two pieces of evidence um, initially were making us think that, you know, how closely are BFRBs and ticks related? Um, but it, it just hasn't held up as much as we thought it would. So they're definitely on a spectrum together, but they're not as close as at one point I thought we had felt they might be. 
-hmm. Thank you. So, um, uh, Mikhail, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name right, so I apologize, at 10.28 a.m. asked something that, again, I I'm going to give you the specific question, um, but I think it it has a broader implication, this question, because a lot of people, of, I've, in my experience, a lot of people avoid or maybe hesitant to seek out help at either a group event or a support group because they're worried about uh, increasing their behavior by seeing others or learning from others about their own behaviors or, or just so. Uh, so the question here, perhaps put better than I just did, is how is it, po is it possible or how is it possible to be stuck doing something just by seeing someone do it? I had a friend who used to swallow and being with her, I started doing the same. And now everyone around me is being affected doing the same swallowing. Is there a, is there brain mirroring that happens? Um, so I think that's a really interesting question right there. Um, and then I would also broaden it for you to, you know, if, if I seek help through a group like this one or through a support group, and now there are a lot of online support groups. So again, if you want support, visit BFRB.org and we can hook you up with an online support group. Um, but sometimes people feel hesitant to attend a conference or a workshop or a support group because of fear of fear of it actually making their problem worse by being exposed to other people's stories of pulling and picking. Mm -hmm. I'll address the latter. We'll start with the back and move towards the front here. So um, that has not been my experience. You know, there are some occasions when people go to a support group and the people that are attending have a more severe form of it. Um, people that are coping well sometimes don't seek out a support group setting. Um, but my experience has been that it's been a huge relief for people. Um, it's addressed the isolation. It's addressed the shame. And if it's a support group that's well run, not a session where people are um, feeling sorry that for themselves that they have this disorder to grapple with, that very often those are settings that can motivate people. It can help them set behavioral goals. It can give them a sense of accountability. So um, I would not agree that that's likely to happen in most cases. Um, your question about how is it possible to be stuck doing something by seeing others, I'm not quite sure. I, I'm grasping what you're asking. I think when we see something, there's an innate curiosity that we may want to try it to see what it feels like. Um, but in terms of getting stuck doing it repetitively, I'm not quite sure what that is. I don't know if Dr. Mansueto or Penzel want to comment. Uh, uh, yes, uh, the um, that issue of of well, first the, the broader issue is group any kind of group experiences help, and the answer is in general. We believe they do. In fact, that's one of the things that's recommended by TLC and by many therapists is to, uh, if you can find a, a, a group uh, that provides support, then by all means do that. We think it's a, a valuable element. Can it ever work the other way? And the answer is probably yes. That uh, some people perhaps, for example, a, a different kind of example, go to AA and feel they need to drink more than before they went to the AA meeting. Uh, there are different people, different motives, different complexities to things. So it's very important for a person to learn about themselves and how they react uh, to the experience. So I think that it's it's uh, unlikely to do any damage to explore uh, how it feels to be joining a group either online or to meet in person or to go to a retreat or to a, a, a conference. Uh, most people report it's been a valuable experience for them. Um, uh, we are likely much less to hear from people who have felt that that it was not useful, in fact, in fact counterproductive. So it's important to know yourself, to be, uh, to be willing to explore different possibilities and to find channels that serve you well in your, in your goals and your values. So, uh, so I would say it's worth uh, trying it. And, uh, and if it doesn't seem to suit you, you can always pull back or find a different group too. Because group, all groups have different constituencies and different qualities to them. And everyone is not everybody's, every single person's cup of tea. So that's just some thoughts. And Fred, you'll pick up on some of that, I'm sure. Yeah, I, I would just like to say that I uh, ran uh, regular groups for 15 years. 
uh, myself, and, and was the moderator. And I got to say that I never heard any reports of anything like that happening. I, it, interestingly, among my OCD patients, there was sort of like an obsessive doubt that, oh, maybe I'll pick up somebody else's OCD, for instance, if I hear them talking about what they obsess about. But it, it always turned out that that was just a, a fear. A, a fear. And, it, and it never came to pass. I never saw anybody take on anybody else's symptoms. But it's, it's common, uh, actually, in, in OCD for people to worry about that. But I, I would say that uh, I think that the advantages of going to a group, I think, far outweigh any, any potential uh, uh, for, for taking on anybody else's symptoms. I, I think most people sort of come to their symptoms on their own, basically, and don't really uh, need much help from anybody else. Uh, that would that would be my my own take on it, and and as has been said, I think you know, uh, getting past the the stigma, uh, getting past the feeling that you're alone and you're the only one, I think I think is extremely valuable, and and getting encouragement from other people who have been where you are or who are where you are, uh, I think is is a tremendous help and can make a a, a big difference. Uh, the only groups I would be concerned about would be ones where they just become like extended gripe sessions where people just sit around and talk about how bad it is and how bad they are and how nothing works and nothing uh, can help them. So I would be uh, very uh, wary of groups like that. I think groups that tend to encourage people to help themselves to uh, take responsibility for their own symptoms, really support and help each other. Those are the kind of uh, groups that you want. And I think if you found one like that, you should uh, count yourself fortunate. I love that one point uh, you made there, Fred, and because it, it reminds us something that should be said, and that is that while the focus is on, on the hair pulling or skin picking and stopping that, uh, a very critical part of the bigger picture uh, is the shame, isolation, uh, that that is a side effect of this pulling. And that's some of the things that, that uh, as Fred pointed out, can be... Uh, really uh, helped a great deal by joining the community of others and realizing that those others are are are, are rich human beings they're rich in the sense of having qualities and and achievements and and personalities quite uh, that can be quite pleasing so it really helps to join that to see that and and by that uh, uh, often people feel less uh, hurt by their by the the skin picking and hair pulling uh in on their self in their self-esteem and so forth so that i think is a very useful aspect of uh of making the effort to find others and speak with them about the personal and private experiences and emotions and hurt that that uh, bfrbs can cause in an individual's life if i could just add one thing actually also build on what you said is that i think if you go to a, a good group I think you're more likely to find a good role model than you are to take on somebody else's symptoms, and, and I think that's why why you go to these things often. And in fact, when you when you go to the uh, annual TLC conferences, uh, you also see uh, people come away and say, "Wow, you know, for the first time, I was talking about uh, what I was experiencing, and I could see other people nodding their heads, or or uh, who who felt exactly what I felt, or I heard my words coming out of somebody else's mouth." And all, and I think that 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 has a very powerful effect that you can't even just get in a therapy session necessarily, or or reading a book. I think being there with people who are in the same situation as you are is is extremely uh, comforting. It's helpful, and and it can certainly uh, uh, you know let you know that you're part of a bigger community who, who's dealing with the same things that you are. Thank you. So Melinda at 10.35 a.m. had a, a, an important question, I think. Uh, sh uh, she writes, logging patterns, awareness enhancement, intervention, and habit reversal, habit reversal are all great and make sense, but with a preteen and young teen don't seem realistic, at least in our case. Are there different treatment methods for young people versus adults, or do they just have to mature before treatment will really help? Well, uh, kids are a challenge in many ways, right? <laughs> we want them to do chores. We want them to uh, stop fighting with their sibling. We want them to uh, do their homework without without constantly reminding and nagging them. Uh, it's a there there are interesting challenges. Plus, they 
the kids at different ages are developmentally not up to always to be self-aware and to uh, uh, working toward complicated goals. Uh, plus, there's always a potential for uh, this uh, hair pulling, skin picking to become a battleground within the household uh, with parents, in a sense, seeming to want their child to stop these behaviors or the teenager more than the teenager or child seems to want to do it. Uh, so there are challenges in working with kids about uh, in therapy, but people who will work well with children and work well with adolescents realize that you really have to work well with the entire family in a sense. And that, uh, that a lot of the work with children, no matter what the disorder uh, is often, uh, working with the family to support healthy behaviors in the best possible ways and to and to uh, uh, find ways not to let this become a standoff between parents because kids will always win so if 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 it uh, if you want me to stop I'm I don't you know I don't want to do what you say and, and parents say well you're gonna stop I'm gonna get, well the kid's gonna win and uh, and not only that it can be even if it's not a conscious thing the stress and strain within the family can add to the fuel for the fire here for the it can actually uh, work against stopping and, and increasing the emotional uh, context that can fuel the uh, the BFRB so there is a certain complexity to it uh, I'll mention a a book that uh, was written by my colleague Ruth Gollum, um, and it was originally called Stay Out of My Hair, which I loved. It was advice to parents, uh, but now it's called A Parent's Guide to uh, uh, to Hair Pulling, um, and in the second edition, and they go through the many complexities. We often have to work with the motivational system. Kids don't always have intrinsic motivation to reach the goals that we have for them. Plus, they're very spontaneous. They're not always thinking about the future. I don't have to study now because I want to, I'm going to be a jet pilot. You don't have to read in a plane. Well, they don't realize that that in order to become a jet pilot, they, there are going to be very many demands that, 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 are, that start now with doing your homework and getting through this grade. Uh, so we do have different issues with children. They are workable because uh, therapy with children can be very effective. Um, even during these times, Terry Vavracek, another one of my colleagues, uh, is has running an online group with children and in another room, so to speak, not really in another uh, in another uh, discussion group on Zoom, uh, the parents are meeting concurrently. So there's an orchestration between the work that the parents are doing and the individual work that the children are doing. And the kids are bonding like you would never would would expect and, and hope that they would, as we see at the conferences. They become instant friends and they're they're like wanting to go to therapy because they get to with their friends and they're exchanging uh, emails and, and, you know, it's a really wonderful thing to see. Uh, our, our therapists who are working with it, we have three of them working with, it, are, uh, with the group, are very excited about it. So, so there are there are ways of working with kids and adolescents that do require separate set of skills. There are challenges in working with any disorders, but the problems of BFRBs are are even perhaps more so because the kids. Uh, many of our techniques are self self applied. We're not following a person around and, and treating them. We're we're hoping that they'll do things. And kids are notorious for forget you know doing what they feel like in the situations that they are and not remembering the importance of goals. So that's why, thank goodness, there are wonderful child and adolescent therapists who work so well with this and other disorders. But it does require more than just the skills that are specifically applied to stopping the hair pulling or skin picking, if you follow that last point. Yeah, I just want to echo that. I think more harm can be done than good if parents insist on, you know, a teenager being in treatment. You know, they're probably just going to go subterranean with their picking and pulling. They're going to do it in the bathroom or they're going to do it in their bedroom at night. Uh, the last thing we want is for them to conclude that cognitive behavioral treatment doesn't work, for them to have an aversion to those of us that could help them. I realize it's anguishing for a mom, a dad, a mother particularly, if they see a teenage you know, girl who has pulled out half of her hair and if she's being you know, teased, a younger child being bullied. Um, it has to have a developmental approach. When the child is younger, the parents can be more involved. But as the child ages, the parents really have to back off and let the child make their choice. It's it's hard enough to treat this 
you know, we don't have all the answers we want to have. Um, we all have to be humble that are in this business. Um, but you absolutely have to have the person meeting you um, where you have to have the therapist meeting the, the patient where they are. And the patient has to have enough motivation to apply the skills or else it's going to fail. I just want to add the resource that um, I'm not sure if Charlie mentioned or not. Um, the self-help book for kids uh, called the, the Hair Pulling in Quotes Habit and You. Um, it's written for quite young children, but it's again, it's another self-help guide to doing the, the, the home method of behavior therapy. Um, and I've, I find it really useful for even adults. <laughs> but now that there's an adult self-help guide out, it's maybe ne less necessary to use it with the adults. Um, but that can be a helpful resource. And it's really, it's got illustration. So for younger children, for teenagers, they probably would not um, they, they might not, they might find it too young and not, not want to be associated with a, a book that feels like it's for little kids, but it's, yeah. uh, and that was, yeah, that just actually was interpreted at different clinics. Uh, clinics have used that book and interpreted it for adults. Let me just, my book awareness is coming back to me. That <laughs> book, like the hair pulling habit in you is, was written many years ago, but it's still uh, vital and useful. Uh, that was written by Ruth Gollum and Sherry Vavracek, who was my, uh, my, uh, who are uh, my colleague at the Behavior Therapy Center. Uh, Ruth Gollum also, I mentioned the uh, what originally was called Stay Out of My Hair and now the Parent Guide to uh, Hair Pulling was written by uh, Suzanne Mouton Odom, who's often on also on my, our Science Advisory Board, and Ruth Gollum, who's, uh, who's uh, been involved with that. And I thought, I actually know the name of our new book. Uh, I cheated. I had to look it up on my... Uh, <laughs> But I'm gonna read it. It's it's called Overcoming Body Focused Repetitive Behaviors. Overcoming Body Focused Repetitive Behaviors, a comprehensive behavioral treatment for hair pulling and skin picking. And it's by Mansueto, Sherry Vavracek, and Ruth Gollum. And that's that's so now I've gotten the book things out of the way. And uh, <laughs> good. But, um, all right, we are we're closing in on we've got about 15 minutes left in our session. Um, so I have more questions to pose to you. And I apologize in advance if I don't get to all of your questions. I'm trying to make sure I get to questions that seem to cover maybe a few different people's uh, ground. Um, and 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 I want to swing back. Also, the, the focus of this was specifically uh, around like coping in this time of COVID. So um, Jude asked earlier, you know, about uh, the importance of routine, or I mean, sometimes just these days we're just even having trouble just getting out of bed, and you know, sort of motivating. And so. I, if, if you all could just speak a little bit specifically around, you know, during this time of isolation, you, you started with some of this, but I have a feeling some of our audience might have come in uh, not right at the very beginning. And it could be really helpful to just speak a little bit to the specifics of BFR, BFRBs right now while we're all locked up at home. I think as I, as I had mentioned earlier on that, uh, you know, boredom, and and uh, disruption can can things can sort of go either way in terms of uh, uh, pulling and picking and either either one of those things can uh, certainly have an effect. But I uh, I believe and and I as I had also mentioned earlier I, I tell all my patients that right now that it's particularly important to have a routine to have a schedule to have a purpose to each day and to to uh, have something that you can. Uh, no, look ahead and know that you're going to be doing it at a certain time instead of just sort of drifting around your house trying to think, oh, what do I do next, or or how can I fill up my day? I think I think having some kind of a plan is is very important. Uh, boredom certainly is it can be a big input into uh, picking and pulling, so you, you have to watch out for that. Or just feeling frustrated because you have nothing to do. This is a good time to either learn new skills, to catch up on things that you didn't have time to do, and things were you know just. Uh, prior to the way they are now. Uh, there, there may be a lot of things you wanted to get to or people you wanted to catch up with or, or a lot of things like that. It could be anything. But I, th I think, again, you should have some kind of a plan for your week, some kind of a shape to things and uh, structure. I think that that's really the active word here is, is provide yourself with some kind of structure. And it doesn't have to be any specific type, whatever suits you. 
but but have a structure of some kind. I, I can't reinforce that enough. You know, and I, with my patients, I actually agree with them on the time they're going to get up, how they're going to exercise, how they're going to connect with people, um, what new skill they're going to learn. There's so many things on the internet. I actually, one of my colleagues compiled like a five page listing of plays and operas and webcams and zoos and, you know, origami instructions and yoga and mindfulness and all of these free sites. And I basically tell people, you're not going to have this window again. I know we didn't choose it. We're not happy about it. But we can clean out, as Dr. Benzel said, we can clean out our garages and our basements and go through our clothes. Um, you know, we can come out of this feeling like we were victimized or we could come out of it feeling like we used the time and we accomplished some things that um, maybe um, we thought we would do. So I'm getting so, a lot, I'm back now, so hopefully people can hear me, but I'll stop at that. Um, oh, sorry, go ahead, Charlie. I was Did you have something to add? <laughs> Did I sound like I was starting to talk? I wasn't like, I wasn't like, Oh, okay, no, that's okay then. Um, covered it all. So, to some extent on the other side of the spectrum, and I, I've been feeling like this is happening. Some people are home and they're, maybe they're out of work or they're, and that's incredibly stressful and they have, and they don't have their normal routine. And then on the other end of the spectrum, a lot of us uh, are, are put in the position of we're still working from home, schooling our children at the same time, trying to keep our houses, you know, cleaner than ever because of germs. Um, and uh, and I, I've, I've lost who asked this question, but, but um, one of our audience asked, you know, how do we just come up with the sheer, I'm at the end of my rope, I'm, I'm overstressed, I'm over, I've got too much to do, I feel at the end of my rope. Um, what, what advice do you have for people who are in, on that side of the, the spectrum of this, uh, this quarantine experience? I think we all have to live in the moment. I think we have to look at the expectations that we have. You know, I think we have to see if there are some things that we can delegate. But for example, the, you know, the online schooling for children, there's just no way the kids are going to master, you know, the content area that they have for that grade. It's hard enough to do crowd control with young children. So I think we make plans, we, we execute them, we see how those things work, and then we modify them. Um, but somehow we need to focus on the things that we are doing rather than the things that we can't do or the things that maybe are not working as, as well as we would like. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I, I could also speak to that in a way too. I think I, I, I've had this discussion actually a few times with some of my patients in the last few weeks is, is the idea of having uh, establishing priorities instead of saying, well, I perfectionistically have to get everything done all at once. You know, I have to be uh, the perfect uh, homemaker and the perfect uh, at home schooling person and all these other things. I think I think you just uh, set up an, an order of priorities, like what matters more than what things that you need, you absolutely need to get done in a particular day, things that would be nice if you could get done, but they're not crucial. And then things that probably don't really matter one way or the other. I think you have to sort of divide things up almost into like different uh, baskets in a sense, different categories and, and arrange them that way. So, and do them in that order, because this, if you think you can get everything done perfectionistically in one day, uh, you need to consider your own perfectionism in, in that case and, and realize that, no, you're probably not ever going to get everything done. Nobody does. I don't, I don't know anybody who gets everything done all the time. So, so don't put that kind of pressure on yourself. Do what can be done, do what's realistic to be done, be flexible about the way you go about these things. But, but don't, if you get yourself stressed out with it, not only will you not get everything done, but now you'll have to deal with the stress that you created within yourself. So, so again, be, be realistic uh, and, uh, and have priorities. One other thing I, I think I would add, there's a, an approach in CBT to dealing with depression called, <clears throat> excuse me, activation therapy. And activation therapy, <clears throat> excuse me, has, uh, has been found to be useful for anxiety, to make an impact on reducing anxiety, to improving mood. So reducing depression, and no doubt when these things occur, uh, they also um, impact on other things we're trying to do or, or trying to accomplish goals that uh, dealing with stress and strains or problems like BFRPs. And it's it's kind of simple. It's there are 
uh, empirically, in other words, evidence-based, research-based uh, uh, behaviors that reduce anxiety and improve mood. And these are things like getting some exercise, uh, to try, uh, uh, getting fresh air, uh, uh, reaching out to other people, connecting with other people, uh, doing productive productive things, reaching, uh, in other words, cleaning out your sock drawer, matching your socks or, or cleaning out piles. I, my, I'm in the man cave now, my wife calls it, and, and it's never looked cleaner since, <laughs> since uh, for decades. Uh, I've cleaned up a little and it feels good. It feels good to have done that. And, uh, and so um, there are other, these are things that, that all of us should be practicing. Um, some of them a little harder, getting out, getting exercise, getting daylight in the eyeballs, being among nature. But if you could find ways of putting these things into your life, and I can put them into my life, we'll all be better off. We'll have our anxiety reduced. We'll have. We'll be addressing our moods, which may be, in a sense, the boredom and so forth. These behaviors. So, so that is doing healthy things, getting good rest, eating well. All of these things make everything better in a way. These are our universal medicines. We don't have to look for the next breakthrough. These are healthy things that have specifically physical and psychological benefits that are provable and, and accessible to every individual without paying for fancy doctor fees. <laughs> uh, so, so please, by all means, do the remember to include in, in, in daily life the, the kinds of some of the kinds of uh, things I mentioned. Uh, one of the other things uh, it, that uh, has been shown to move that needle toward better improved mood in a very surprising way has been the um, to keep a log. Here's with G. Sorry, I'm blocking on gratitude log. Uh, where at the end of the day, just to record the things, even in, in these times, the, the things that to to look out and see a beautiful sunset, or uh, or to enjoy a surprise call, or have the meal, uh, uh, some some. Uh, things that were reheated, tasted, uh, the an enjoyable conversation we had with someone, uh, our spouse or, or someone within the house, our child, uh, just to say thank you for these little glimmers. Even in hard times, there are things to enjoy. Well, that activity, the evening gratitude log, has uh, Martin Seligman, a very famous psychologist who talks about positive psychology, about moving, about not focusing so much on what's wrong, but focusing on the right things can do so much to improve human the human condition. And perhaps in these times, we need those things more than ever, the simple things in life that always have served human beings and, and somehow adjust our brain chemistry, adjust our mood, and make us probably better people in the long run. I stunned everybody into silence, but <laughs> nothing else to say. <laughs> no, it's beautiful, but so important. It's very, very easy to, I mean, I'm sure we've all found ourselves in a lot of conversations that are just about all the, the worries. And it's very hard to live in such a state of limbo right now, not knowing and what feels like what's coming next. Um, but um so I, I, you know, anyway, I just reiterate <laughs> what you said so well that that there are some silver linings, even when we're going through really deep pain right now, which which many of us are. Um, there are some moments of beauty and good. Things. Can I make one more point also, which I think is very important that I, I think we haven't addressed also. There's there's a thing that I, I refer to among my patients as information overload. I think that what you need to do is kind of uh, limit your intake of news about what's going on. I think sometimes you can get hit with so, ma so much negative information and, and so many uh, uh, conflicting uh, ideas about, you know, what, what's good, what's not good, what, where we're going, where we're not going, that I think it can become overwhelming at times. So I, I recommend that to my own patients that they, they devote a little time early in the day to just catch up on the latest developments and then kind of give it a rest and, and don't constantly sit there and, and absorb all these, these uh, uh, doom and gloom messages. And I'm not saying, you know, you should be detached from what's going on. I'm saying, you know, stay current with things, but at the same time, don't con constantly hit yourself all day with, uh, with information about these things. I, I think that, like I said, there's such a thing as information overload. Too much of anything is no good for a person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I'll just add that um, there are, as we, as we think about moving forward from this event, um, I'm so grateful to the IOCDF for bringing us all together today. And that really is one of the silver linings of this time is that we can find new ways to come together. And, and it's so much easier to schedule than it ever was in the past. Um, so that's that's exciting. Um, and so I know there's much more programming that the IOCDF is doing. And TLC, the TLC Foundation for BFRBs, our website is bfrb.org. Uh, we also have a whole lot of events coming up, including just weekly sort of hangout chats um, so we're just trying to help combat uh, the isolation um, of these times by using these virtual ways of coming together. Uh, and so just keep, you know, keep seeking that out because that's for me been what's brought me the most joy is when I've gone to connect with others, um, even if it isn't as nice as being able to be there right in person with everybody. Um, on the other hand, I've, you, you can connect with people that, you know, you might not have been able to connect with at all in the past. So uh, keep on the lookout for, for lots more programming from both both the IOCDF and TLC um, and just take advantage of it. Um, we're trying to be here for you right now. And um, it also brings us great joy when you participate because you're doing, uh, you're, you're, you're providing healing for us too. So it's win-win. And um, Nancy, Charlie and Fred, I just thank you so much for giving all this time uh, to our community, as you always have done for the last more than 30 years. Um, so grateful. Um, and it's always so much fun to be with you. Thank you for moderating and, and your leadership. Oh, thanks. Thank you. So thank you all. Bye, <laughs> Bye everybody. Well, nice